From our motel balcony, we watched the sunrise light up the distant cloud across the ocean. Since 4am a diesel engine had been shunting sea containers along the beachfront to the container ship ready to transport them to Melbourne, a daily procedure we were told. Heading west along the coast from Burnie, we turned in towards Table Cape, passing by the freshly planted tulip fields as the Cape came into view. Pausing on top of the Cape for a picture shoot, we had a good view of the surrounding coastline and Bass Strait. The lighthouse, strategically placed on this high plateau, stood out in stark relief. Morning tea was taken in Wynyard, where our eye was taken by this restored Dirac from 1905, the only one in Australia. The owner purchased the engine from a gentleman in Tasmania but the other parts were found in New Zealand and England. Moving on, we arrived at Highfield House, an historic colonial residence at Stanley. We were welcomed by Jenny, who was to be our host and who filled us in with the history of the old house. Built by Helia, the architect, between 1832 and 35, the house was the residence of Edward Kerr, chief agent for the Van Diemen's Land Company. Years later, it was purchased by the Ford family. The Highfields historic site is an important part of Tasmania's historic heritage. Covering one wall, were several portraits of the original owners. The laundry revealed a glimpse of the domestic life at that time. Stairs led down to the stone-walled basement and portion of one wall was cut away to expose the lath and plaster finish. Commenced late in 1838, the chapel was never completed. Services were first held in a section of the cottage until 1841. The company had a fine collection of horses on the property. The stables were erected in 1836 to 37. The Ford family continued to breed good quality bloodstock. The barns were amongst the earliest buildings on the property. An old rotting cart and some old farm machinery added flavour to the history of the site. A small monument set in a country-style garden paid tribute to Juliana, daughter of the Kerr family, who was killed in a tragic accident. From the homestead, we looked across to Stanley and the massive promontory known as the Nut. Stanley was to be our lunch stop for this day. Uh, as I say, this is our lunch stop. The town was named after Lord Stanley, the British Secretary of State of for War and the Colonies. Today it is a picturesque fishing village. In 1936, a submarine telephone and telegraph cable from Apollo Bay to Stanley provided the first connection between Tasmania and the mainland. Two small dogs belonging to the museum curator drew our attention. Their owner allowed us to visit the museum and the Anglican church to view the stained glass windows. On arrival at Allendale Gardens, 12 kilometres south of Smithton, we were invaded by several small dogs eager to enter the coach. Trees and shrubs from all over the world and... Uh... We spent some time with the owner, walking through a small part of this two and a half hectare landscaped garden with its trees, 
ferns, plants and natural streams that run through the property as well as the bird life. My name is coming up. The resident emu was not at all friendly that day. We needed to keep a close eye on him. Handed camera. <laughs> The goats, however, were only too happy to make our acquaintance, particularly if they thought we had something for them to eat. A variety of plants feature in the garden, and a small Huon pine, planted in the spring of 2008, now 10 years old, captured our attention. Pheasants, guinea fowl and pigeons wander freely in the garden. In the garden cafeteria, we lined up for Devonshire teas and a chat to the owner of the property. <laughs> and that's going to come out good for you, I hope. <laughs> one of our group took a shine to one of the dogs while the proprietor's wife busied herself behind the counter. <laughs> Next morning we left Burnie, travelled east through Penguin and Ulverston, managing to capture a variety of photos of the coast on the way. Arriving at Devonport, we found the mall and visited a small cafe for morning coffee. Judging by the many old vinyl records hanging on the wall, it was obvious that the owner was an ardent collector of memorabilia. At the waterfront, we were able to capture a few shots of the Spirit of Tasmania, the ferry that plies daily between Devonport and Melbourne. We saw McDonald's strategically situated near the cinemas before we entered a well-stocked gift and souvenir shop. We headed south on the Bass Highway to Deloraine for lunch, but on the way called into the Ashgrove Cheese Factory. The factory is situated in Elizabethtown and is a family business owned by the Bennett family. In the 1880s, James Bennett purchased 100 acres of land in the area and generations of Bennetts further increased their holdings. Ashgrove Farms was formed in 1983. Majoring in dairy farming, the Bennetts added value by the establishment of their own cheese factory samples of which we were encouraged to try. One of the family members explained how they made the moulds. It's a hard cheese. If we add salt, we can keep it for five years. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference that the salt will make in the cheese. So once we mix the salt in, we then fill the curd into the moulds. And basically, whatever shape mould you put your curd in, that's what shape cheese you make. Mm -hmm. So mostly we do 5 kilo wheels that look like that, or big 20 kilo blocks that look like this one here. We line the mould with the cloth, and the cloth is blue because blue is not a food colour, so it makes it easy to spot if the bit tears off. 
and the cloth is there to help the curd to mat back together. So we fill the mould with all the little chip pieces of curd and then the lid can sit on the top like that. And the lid has all those rings in it so they can stack on top of each other. Now once we've filled all the moulds up, we then take them through into the press room and they get stacked up on top of each other. When the row's full, a big ram comes down, pushes the lid down into the mould, only goes down about that far. Last bit of whey gets squeezed out all the holes around the edge of the mould and all the little chip pieces of curd get squashed back together. That's glue for beginners. So it's not going to overpower you or be too, too strong. Um, in a couple of years ago, we started bottling milk here in addition to doing the cheese. So all the milk drinks and the coffee that we serve here, as well as the ice cream, is all made using the milk that comes fresh off the farm. And it's a much uh, richer, creamier milk than the standard milk that you buy because we don't standardise it down to a minimum fat content. We leave all the fat that came out of the cow in the milk, which makes it really rich and creamy, and we don't add any permeate to it at all, so we don't dilute it down. A glass window provided us with a view into the storeroom, which was stocked with many varieties of cheeses. Through another window, we viewed the process of manufacture. The first vat of cheese was produced on the 29th of November, 1993. The farm shop was opened in 1994. The cows you see here across the highway are real, but those in the nearby paddock are colourful decoys. These cows were decorated by school groups in a statewide competition. Deloraine was our lunch stop. Opposite the park we found a small cafe which had tables both inside and out on the pavement. An old steam engine displayed in the park with the river behind added a pleasant atmosphere as the swiftly flowing water headed downstream. This seemed to be an ideal spot for a family picnic. On arriving in Launceston, we visited Cataract Gorge Reserve considered to be a wilderness in the heart of the city. Our attention was drawn towards the magnificent suspension bridge and the fast flowing water as it winds its way into and out of the lake. Judy was eager to try out the chairlift that stretched across the lake. She enjoyed the long ride and the view below. A large fenced swimming pool in the centre of the park, surrounded by a lush green lawn, presented a tranquil picture in the late afternoon sun. Walking paths enable access throughout the park, taking us through the abundant plant life and rockeries in and around the gorge. It is here in the soft evening light at Cataract Gorge that we concluded the filming of our tour of Tasmania 2010.